this is it's it's absolutely wonderful to um, to come together in this way for the, the first um, public lecture of the year. Uh, we're trying this year with our new online uh, uh, capacities to offer um, some form of public event on a monthly basis. And uh, here we are in January, uh, well into January already, and we have our first um, uh, occasion, and I'm really very, very happy to be welcoming uh, Professor Leslie Hill, who is uh, um, now, I guess, uh, he's in a retired capacity, but he doesn't, he's, this is not a retiring man, even though he's being careful in the lockdown, he's not retiring in the sense that he has been undertaking some very, very assiduous and uh, careful um, research um, in the, in the, I think it's the last, it's three years now, haven't you? Um, I think um, in 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 the time since he stepped down from the University of Warwick, um, I have been um, actually I've felt very close to Leslie and and his efforts regarding Blanchot for quite some time. We shared some we've shared some experiences together and um, and thoughts and and it's been uh, it's been a, for me a very rich. Um, a uh, relationship, a uh, working relationship, and I'm especially uh, eager to have him now. I mean, we, I, I, I won't go through his entire um, bibliography. That should be available on our webpage. Um, he's written a couple of very important books on Blanchot. He's also written on authors like Barth and uh, Klosowski, and he's he has is a, quite a contributor to the um, uh, to, to the world of uh, research in French modern French letters. Um, and in the UK, he's certainly the, the premier uh, commentator of, of Blanchot. Um, certainly one of the world premier commentators. Um, I, I mentioned he's been very assiduous in, in recent years, and I'm referring in particular to work he's done with respect to uh, Maurice Blanchot's um, background in his political thinking, and specifically the work um, of the pre-war period um, and the beginning of the war in, in his journalistic capacity. Um, this has been a very fraught question. It's been a fraught question for um, uh, many years uh, because a number of accusations have been made against uh, Blanchot, which are sort of poorly documented, but nevertheless uh, persistent. And um, that there are some prominent people have have joined into the um, to a chorus on this uh, topic. Um, but it is it is a very very problematic um, accusation. And Leslie had gone to the work of uh, really seeking to uncover the full context of what we have of Blanchot's writings of the pre-war period. And this is, this is really very important work. It's very extensive and very careful work. I, I, I know Leslie in this way. And so it's invaluable work really for the, uh, for the field of Blanchot studies. And he has uh, recently published on the topic, but we're getting a kind of overview um, uh, today. Um, uh, Leslie, please remind me the title of the new book. I'm, uh, and I don't have it in front of me, so I, it hasn't imprinted itself on my memory. How, how do you, it's, well, as Blanchot we, Politique? Yes, I mean, the, the new book is called Blanchot Politique. Yes. Une réflexion jamais interrompue. There which, we go. Which is a quote from the beginning of La Communauté in yes. Abourra, the unavailable yes. community. Thank um, you. Blanchot Politique, then. Um, yes. And we're getting, we're getting a, a kind of introduction to it. Um, it's a very big book, so uh, this is going to be a useful introduction, but I'm certain that people are going to want to go on and, and get the volume now mm -hmm. and um, take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, let, without further ado, then, let me uh, give the screen to Leslie, and again, with my warmest thanks uh, for, your, for your presence uh, this evening. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Nemanja, for organizing this, and thanks to all of you, um, wherever you may be, um, for coming along, and I hope you're safe and well wherever you are. Leslie, may I interrupt you for just one second? I forgot to say that we will be, you will be, I'm, you will be taking questions and uh, these will be collated by Nemanja Mitrovic during the course of the presentation. Uh, he'll, he'll take these from the chat and then he will uh, deliver these to you after uh, you've completed your, your presentation. Sorry for the interruption, go ahead. That's fine, that's fine. Um, 
So, the political thinking of the writer Maurice Blanchot. Unfortunately, given the limits of time, um, I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface of what are often complex and controversial matters. And I can but refer you to those two books, the one Chris has just mentioned, the most recent one, and the previous one on uh, Jean-Luc Nancy and Blanchot's um, debates. That all started out as a single book about six years ago. The first chapter was meant to be about Nancy's reading of Blanchot. This became a book in its own right, and I just carried on and ended up with probably the content of at least three books. Okay, well, let me let me try and start at the beginning. Um, I don't know how well any of you know Blanchot's outline, so I will just try to fill in a bit of the background. So Blanchot, born 1907, deceased 2003, writer, thinker, critic, and sometime political journalist, is, as some of you will know, arguably one of the most significant intellectual figures in the French 20th century. An influential reader of Mallarmé, Kafka, and many others, and an essential point of reference for Foucault, Derrida, La Coulabart, Beckett, Duras, Jabez, and so on. And during the 1950s and 60s, as well as a leading literary critic and a writer of fiction, Blanchot was probably best known politically as a vigorous critic of the Gaulist Fifth Republic, uh, which was declared amidst great constitutional turmoil in October 1958, and the fierce opponent to of France's ongoing colonial war in Algeria, which didn't end till Algerian independence was granted in 1962. <clears throat> and together with his close friends Dionys Mascolo, Marguerite Duras and Robert Antelme, about whom we could say more later of course, Blanchet was subsequently an uncompromising participant in the upheavals of May 68. And I'm hoping, unlike my children, that you know about May 68. <clears throat> in the 1970s it emerged, however, that between 1934 and 1940, Blanchot had been active as a political journalist in the nationalist, sometimes extremist press. This soon prompted headline grabbing allegations, first in the United States in the 1980s and 1990s, then more recently in France, claiming that in the 1930s and 40s, Blanchot had been an anti-Semite, a proponent of French fascism and a supporter of the collaborationist Vichy regime of Philippe Pétain none of which I hasten to add is actually true. <clears throat> but alongside more justifiable concerns concerning the work of Heidegger, notwithstanding the fact that Blanchot from the very outset was one of Heidegger's most rigorous critics, all this amounted to a concerted effort to discredit Blanchot's later thinking. And still today, the view that predominates is that Blanchot's relationship to his political past is a culpable one not unlike that of Heidegger, though any similarity between the two, I think, is misleading and superficial at best. And later on, if there's time, I'll say a tiny bit more about the irreducible divide between Blanchot and Heidegger. But for the moment, let me try to summarize some of the issues that exercised Blanchot, the political journalist, during the 1930s and 40s, and how they may still be thought relevant to us today. But before I do that, um, if I'm right to say that Blanchot's political past has been badly misrepresented, which is what I'm implying, you may legitimately ask why this may be the case. After all, you might think there's no smoke without fire. But if one examines reception of Blanchot's work, there are perhaps three things worth stressing. First of all, by both temperament and conviction, Blanchot was an ascetic, intensely private person who valued anonymity over fame or reputation, and who, when questions were asked about his political past, just preferred to observe, in public at least, a studied silence, leaving the field open not just for justified criticism, but for any number of wild accusations. Secondly, 
Blanchot had the privilege, or perhaps it was the misfortune, to have his work become better known in the English speaking world, particularly the United States, alongside the writings of Jacques Derrida, at a time when attacks by the American Academy on the political irresponsibility, relativism, willful obscurantism, even nihilism of Derridean deconstruction were at their most intense. And let me be clear, none of that is true either. So rather than attending to the historical record, it therefore became all too easy to dismiss Blanchot's work as deeply compromised by Europe's fascist past. But as attacks on Blanchot in the United States waned, not least occurring owing to the fact, not least owing to the lack of any incriminating evidence, so French commentators, including among, among others Michel Suria, and sadly to my mind Jean-Luc Nancy, took up the baton. Now, like other Western powers, and including the one from which I am speaking this evening, France in the second half of the 20th century experienced many difficulties in coming to terms with its own past. It wasn't until 1995, for instance, that President Jacques Chirac finally acknowledged not only that the collaborationist Vichy regime of 1940 to 44 was a criminal regime, but that responsibility for it lay primarily with France itself, not the Nazi occupation. And similarly, it was only in 1999 that the French Republic accepted that the Algerian War of Independence deserved to be called a war and not an illegal rebellion within France's own borders. Now, in, 18, in 1987, you may, some of you will know this, um, the historian Henri Rousseau published an important and influential book analyzing what he called the Vichy syndrome, in which he quite rightly took issue with the way in which France had willingly drawn a veil over its recent past to avoid responsibility for crimes committed in its name. Historical blindness, however, takes on many forms. It can consist, and I believe this to be the case with Blanchot, in discharging responsibility for the ills of a period onto a convenient scapegoat, not least in order to then to give oneself the air of being a more diligent, a more fearless vampire slayer than the next person. So reception of Blanchot has often been the casualty of a self-serving desire for self-promotion on the part of some of his critics. And attacks on Blanchot, I think, frequently say more about those making accusations than about Blanchot himself. And in this respect, as some of you may know, it's one of the considerable ironies of recent French literary history that several of the writers who in the 30s and 40s were explicitly anti-Semitic or in favor of collaboration with Vichy or the Nazis, and I'm thinking here of names such as Drieux La Rochelle, Paul Morand or Céline, are now considered as worthy, even prestigious members of the French literary canon. While Blanchot, who was strongly opposed to both anti-Semitism and collaboration, is dismissed as toxic. So that by way of preamble, I guess. So let me take you back briefly to the 1930s, to a time when the Treaty of Versailles, signed of course in 1919 at the end of the First World War, sought to establish a new and political, a new and stable political dispensation in Europe. But by the 1930s, the Treaty of Versailles was in deep disarray. Financial speculation had culminated in the Wall Street crash of 1929, with devastating consequences for Germany, France, and Great Britain, among others, to which governments responded at first by adopting a series of austerity measures that only made matters worse, and which led to rising unemployment and ever increasing social inequalities. And the inability of parliamentary governments to resolve the crisis successfully and the discredit to which established ideologies largely, largely fell victim led in turn to an ever more phobic obsession with questions of national identity, not to mention a renewed nostalgia for empire, an increasingly bitter struggle between the secular and the religious and the concerted scapegoating of certain sectors of society. Now, 
all similarities with the time we call our own, as you will have realized, are of course purely co coincidental. So to this testing time of severe economic, social, constitutional, diplomatic crisis. The young Maurice Blanchot, arriving in Paris as a graduate student at the age of 24, responded not by joining a political party, but by embarking on a career as a political journalist. As such, like others of his generation, his position was one of resolute refusal. Not for Blanchot then, the muscular attractions of the dictatorship of the proletariat embodied in the Communist Party, to which many intellectuals turned at the time, but which even more left once they realized, like Blanchot, that the Soviet Union under Stalin only acknowledged legitimate dreams of revolution in order to quash them. And if any doubts remained, it would soon be the time of the Moscow show trials, the millions of deaths caused by, for caused by forced collectivization and the dispatch of millions of others to the Gulag. But neither did the French Socialist Party or SFEU strike Blanchot as any more viable as an alternative, committed as it was to the ineffective legalistic paper diplomacy of the League of Nations and to a pipe dream of international peace, which would soon culminate in the disastrous policy of appeasement. And Blanchot had no sympathy either for the dominant centre-left radical party in France, largely made up of local worthies, given over to parliamentary intrigues and divided between warring factions and personalities. And he had no time either for the influential but deeply reactionary monarchist right, whose only goal was to turn back the clock politically, culturally and socially to a mythic time prior to the, nine, to the 1789 revolution. Bosch in the 1930s rallied nevertheless to a certain kind of French nationalism, not least because being associated with no single party, it allowed its advocates a wide margin of critical independence. And nationalism, as we, as we know today, is a many headed monster. It can be on the one hand, a distasteful expression of fantasies of imperial domination, xenophobia, racism, white supremacy, and worse. I'm speaking to you from England, of course. But it can also embody a desire for autonomy, self-determination, and freedom from external influences. At any event, when in 1933, Blasio embarked on his first sustained period of political journalism in the short-lived daily Le Rampart, he did so in partnership with Paul Levy, a secular Jew, an independent newspaper proprietor, who from 1921 onwards was deeply opposed to German then Nazi imperialism, insofar as it represented in his eyes an existential threat to France, and was convinced, as was Blanchot, of the dismal failure of successive French governments to deal effectively with the enemy on the opposite side of the Rhine. Now, I have for you just a page from Le Rampart, which I will attempt to share with you, just to give you an idea of what was going on. So this is, so this is the front page of Le Rampart. It dates from 1933, so only months after uh, Hitler became chancellor, and it's just after the 1st of May. And you can see in the cartoon, at the bottom, which is probably the easiest thing. The contrast, it's fairly crude, but it nonetheless tells you a lot about the um, feelings at the time. On the left, you of course have the peaceful French with this the 1st of May. So in France, you have little bunches of lily of, lily of the valley, muguet, which they're all selling in rather homely fashion. While, whereas on the other side of the Rhine, on the right-hand side, you have in Berlin, you have 60,000 cannons all pre preparing for war. <clears throat> so that was the first major um, initiative that Blanchot um, was involved in as a journalist writing um, articles editing Le Rampin run, as I say, by Paul Levy, who is a, an important um, figure, as far as Blanchet is concerned, throughout the whole of the 1930s. Indeed, before 
both before and after 1933, supported by the editor Blanchot, Levy did not cease warning his readers that in order to preserve peace, France should prepare for possible war and take energetic action wherever necessary. If not, war with Germany would one day become inevitable. If you wish for peace, ran the traditional axiom shared by Levy and Blanchot alike, then prepare for war. So this then was the nationalism that Blanchot deemed it essential to defend. But successive governments in his view had shown themselves cruelly wanting. Whence the need, as he saw it, given the ineffectual compromises, the corrupt clientelism, political bankruptcy of the parliamentary regime at the time for, I quote, spiritual or national revolution. These are words which he used in an article that appeared in Le Rampart later that year. Now these words, which are very much of their epoch, Everyone, everyone who was everybody uh, would write at the time about the need for spiritual and national revolution. So the words which are very much of their epoch have often been misrepresented as an appeal to French fascism. But the evidence tells a rather different story. Um, in June 1933, for instance, again in Le Rampart, Blanchot would write that, I quote, our greatest hope today is that for a free nation, for the defense of humankind, for all that is of value in the human spirit, there should arise the magnificent promise of revolution. So this is revolution in the name of universal values, not narrow um, nationalistic ones. For Blanchard was in no doubt what fascism meant. On the 1st of May in this same issue of Le Rampin, as you can see before you, Blanchot was denouncing the, I quote, anti-Semitic violence, and I quote again, the barbaric persecutions of the Jews by the Nazis, pointing out that such measures had, again, I quote, no specific political purpose. A comment that some latter-day critics have thought somehow to be half-hearted on Blanchot's part. But this is a good example, I think, of what happens when critics, as they often do, choose to ignore political or historical context. For it is clear that the point Blanchot is making, and making against those appeasers who claimed, without any evidence at all, of course, that it was the Jews themselves, having become too prominent in the Weimar Republic, who were ultimately responsible for Nazi anti-Semitism, and that Hitler, in attacking the Jews, was, was therefore politically justified in doing so. Blanche, of course, degree, disagreed absolutely. And there was no valid political purpose involved in Nazi anti-Semitism, he maintained, merely an ideological one, expressive in Blanchot's words of, again, I quote, a racist mystique, and I quote again, a new religion, which is that of perverted nationalism, designed to make scapegoats of the Jews and bring on, as Blanchot again writes, a civilization in which individuals and the human spirit will be denied essential freedoms. Now, Laurent Powers, you probably can make out from that rather poor um, photocopy, operated on a shoestring and didn't survive much beyond 1933. But the following year, Blanchot began writing leader articles in this second newspaper, um, the Journal des Débats which was a prestigious liberal conservative evening daily, whose history went back 150 years. Blanche at one point compares it to the New York Times, but which in the 1930s, with their ever diminishing readership, was struggling to make its way in a competitive marketplace. Now Blanchot's job on the paper, which he would carry on doing until the summer of 1940, was to write stylish leader articles whose political orientation was determined or suggested by the general editor and which expressing the opinion of the paper remained unsigned. You can probably see an example of that in the far left of this front page. This of course dates from March 1936 and I'll explain why I've chosen that date in a bit where you have a, the first column is the leader article, which is not signed, um, for 
all of six years or so, Blanchot wrote, I don't think all of these, but a significant number of these um, without ever signing them. One can, you know, get a sense of how Blanchot writes after a while, but um, they are essentially anonymous. And there are plainly damn moments when Blanchot's views would diverge from those of the paper. But it is safe to assume, I think, that the vast majority of these leader articles published in the paper closely reflected Blanchot's own political standpoint. Indeed, though the tone was different as far as domestic, social and economic policy was concerned, the Journal des Débats pursued many of the same objectives as did Le Rampart. That is to say, severe criticism of the paper diplomacy of the League of Nations, severe condemnation of the unstable and ineffectual French parliamentary system and sustained opposition to Germany and Nazi ideology. So in 1936, matters came to a head. By then, as you probably know, prospects for a popular front victory in the May parliamentary elections, based on an alliance between the uh, centre-left radical party, the left socialists and the far left communists under socialist leadership seemed increasingly likely. But on the 7th of March, so before the election, Hitler took advantage of the situation, the transitional situation in France to send his army into the Rhineland, which under the 1926 Locarno Treaty had been declared a demilitarized zone. Now the Rhineland included all that territory to the west of the Rhine between um, Germany and France, which after the end of the First World War, French authorities wanted to turn into, a, into an autonomous protective buffer zone. And so this had been declared, um, this, this had been declared in 1926, a demilitarized zone. But on the 7th of March, 1936, Hitler's generals marched into the Rhineland. It is said that they had orders, if they met any opposition from the French or the British or any of the allies, that they should retreat if they encountered any military opposition from the allies, but none came. There followed, of course, urgent discussions between the French government and, the arm, and its army as to the, the best policy to adopt. And there were urgent diplomatic consultations too with the British government, who, was, who had guaranteed the Locarno Treaty. With the result that the French and British governments decided that this moment of high crisis to do precisely nothing. Or rather they referred the matter to the League of Nations, which amounted to exactly the same thing. And by the 29th of March, Hitler was able to hold a plebiscite in the Rhineland in which 98% of the German folk were found to approve what was now called the liberation of the Rhineland. I'll take that off just to give you a bit of variety. Now, most historians today for most historians today, Hitler's remilitarization of the Rhineland in March 1936 was a turning point and marks the first decisive step on the road towards World War II. But at the time, of course, reactions were more divided. Many, like the socialists, radicals or communists, breathed a sigh of relief. After all, peace had prevailed, not war. On the monarchist right, the thinking was much the same. No war, no war. Above all, no war. Only a few disagreed, however. Among them, the sociologist and political commentator Raymond Aron, a very prestigious figure in later years, as well as the Lieutenant Colonel and future General Charles de Gaulle, who of course led All of them clearly realized that Hitler would not be content with reoccupying the Rhineland, but as the next four years would demonstrate, would make ever greater, more imperious demands on Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and finally Luxembourg, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, 
and France itself. And that was why, and that's why, alongside a trio of leading ministers, including the Prime Minister at the time, Albert Serrault, the Foreign Minister, Pierre-Étienne Flandin, and the Communications Minister, Georges Mandel, and explain in a moment why the names are important. So together with these three leading ministers, Blanchot was firmly in favor of a vigorous military response to Hitler's incursion into the Rhineland. By 1936, while still writing for the Journal des Débats and working alongside Lévy as editor of the satirical weekly Aux Écoutes, which I'll come to in a bit, Blanchard had begun to contribute a more or less regular article for the monthly Combat. Now, let me try to share my screen again. Um, so that's the Journal des Débats you saw earlier on. Okay. All right. Whoops, sorry. Um, by the middle of 1936, Blanchot had begun contributing to this um, much more modest uh, monthly. At its height, Kumba uh, had a thousand subscribers. So from the from early in 1936, then while still working still writing for the Journal des Débats for the Écoute, Blanchet had begun to contribute a more or less regular article to this monthly combo. Indicalist, sometimes manic, monarchist, far right. And Blanchard's involvement in Kumba, for which he wrote eight articles in all, has been widely criticized and forms the basis for claims that he was at this time an explicit proponent of anti-Semitism, even political terrorism. Now, crucial to such claims is an article published in this issue of um, uh, Kumba in April 1936 called Après le coup de force Germanie. So this is reacting to the events of the previous month, which I was just uh, uh, describing when Hitler um, Hitler's incursion, so reacting to Hitler's incursion into the Rhineland. Now, readers of Blanchot's journalism will be aware of the often violently polemical, but invariably cogent and incisive manner in which he presents his arguments. Rarely, in other words, if ever, is Blanchot incoherent or self-contradictory. But this article, published in April 1936, is in this respect remarkable. On the one hand, it makes the exact same points as Blanchot had made elsewhere, which is that in responding to Hitler's incursion into the Rhineland with grand sounding words but no action, the French government, I quote, said everything it shouldn't have and did nothing of what it should have, which simply amounted to accepting the Nazi fait accompli. And in a, in a, in a in a penultimate article for Combe published in November 1937, Blanchot said much the same. France, he argued, and I quote, has always been careful not to intervene while pretending to intervene. France's disastrous foreign policy, in other words, consisted in attempting to appease the enemy and merely conveyed the image, the, merely, merely conveyed the message that quite frankly, the enemy, i.e. the warmongering Nazi regime, could do whatever it wanted with impunity. And you all know what happened next. So, so far, so logical. But readers of this April 1936 article, few as they were, can but have been surprised in that very same article in which, let me repeat, the French government is criticized for its verbose and ineffectual response to find a quite different passage, denouncing, again, I quote, the clan of ex-pacifists, revolutionaries, and emigre Jews who would do anything to overthrow Hitler and put an end to Europe's dictatorships. Critics have, of course, been quite rightly shocked by the explicit anti-Semitism and pro-Nazi sentiments expressed in these words. In much the same way that, with equal good reason, they have taken offence at the passage which follows, according to which, again, I quote, the unworthy Sarrow governments 
paid undue attention to the demands of those revolutionaries and rampant Jews whose theological fury demanded that all possible sanctions be applied immediately against Hitler. And the passage continues in similar vein and ends with these ominous words. As of today, three men stand accused. It was the three ministers I picked out earlier on. Three men stand accused. Serro, Flandin, Mandel will pay for the risks to which, by their own doing, peace has been exposed. And this is often read as a threat that they will be assassinated. Now, to date, curiously enough, few commentators have noted the uncharacteristic but flagrant contradiction that exists between these two diametrically opposed arguments presented along, alongside one another in this same April 1936 article. At one moment, you remember, the French government is being criticized for its failure to respond forcefully as the occasion demanded. But at the next, it's been attacked for being excessively belligerent, responsibility for which is attributed to ex-pacifists, revolutionaries, and emigre Jews. And it is, of course, as I mentioned, those Three members of the government, Sarro, Flandin and Mandel, who like Blanchet were in favor of a vigorous riposte, who are now being pilloried as the most culpable. So it seems to me there is only one solution here, which is that the anti-Semitic language found in the article is not Blanchet at all, but that the article has been doctored, that is to say, manipulated, modified and partially rewritten by other members of Kumba in order to reflect their own anti-Semitism and support for appeasement. Views it's not hard to find them expressing in other journals of the period. And if you want to know more, you will have to read the book. Um, for this, this, I'd argue, is not an isolated example. Although the instances of anti-Semitic phraseology to be found in Blanchet's own articles are relatively few, one can say that in every case, they're almost certainly the result of an editorial intervention by someone other than Blanchot. And this sort of thing was quite common in those kinds of journals at the time. Now, Though Blanchot refused, for reasons which I think are now clear, to contribute to the next May 1936 issue of Cornbar, he did, however, carry on writing for the journal till the end of 1936, and again for two months only at the end of 1937, at which point he put a final stop to his involvement. One can and should ask, I think, why Blanchot persisted at all. But a further notorious article published in Cornbar in July 1936, so um, two months later, supplies something of an answer. The piece in question bears the self-consciously shocking and alarming title, Terrorism, a Method of Public Safety. And many other readers who were and still are shocked and alarmed by the article, as was surely the writer's intention. And yet the logic of Blanchot's argument is clear enough. It was written at a time when the newly elected Popular Front radical socialist communist uh, government enjoyed widespread support, such that even today it is remembered through rose-tinted spectacles. And Blanchot's article is a withering attack on the mediocrity of the government, its reluctance to bring about truly radical social or economic change, and its woeful complacency in dealing with the Nazi threat. Now, what is to be done, asks Blanchot, with a government that is a danger to the country, to lives and livelihoods, it enjoys almost total support and is at any event the legally elected government of the day. Now, Blanchot's frustration was intense and this explains the rhetorical violence of this and other articles. But in invoking the spectre of terrorism in provocative fashion, Blanchot's point was straightforward enough. It was that a legally elected government was not necessarily a legitimate one. And again, as I said earlier, all similarities with the present time are purely coincidental. Between legitimacy and legality, there was a necessary tension or dissymmetry which was essential to preserve both by maintaining the two as well 
and in their mutual irreducibility. If one conflated them, no, leg no legitimate opposition would be possible, and so-called legality would turn into authoritarian dictatorship. But if one were tempted for that reason to do without any proper legal framework, the outcome would be chaos. At any event, if a legal government were deemed illegitimate, the only recourse would be to adopt a strategy of opposition that was by definition illegal. A few years later, of course, now faced with a Vichy government that was quite rightly viewed as illegitimate, but which nevertheless claimed to be the legal government of France, such that a dissenting leader like the General de Gaulle was immediately denounced as a traitor and a terrorist, the French resistance would come to know the complexities which then followed only too well. For, it can be th for if it can be thought legitimate, as we've seen only recently, I think, to oppose a legally elected power, this doesn't mean that an illegal power, as we've also seen more recently, might therefore be deemed legitimate. Nothing is that simple. Russia's argument in 1936 was, however, a deeply provocative one. And this explains, I think, why he chose to express it in a journal such as Kumba, existing on the margins of political debate rather than in a mainstream paper like the Journal des Débats. Provocative though it may be, there is, I think, nothing fascistic about Blanchard's argument, something he makes clear by appealing in his title to the Committee of Public Safety of spring 1793, so at the time of the French Revolution, that sought to defend the Republic and the nation, both in danger, against foreign invasion and civil war. And in that sense, one might even say that Blanchot's argument was inseparable from an endorsement of democracy. And yet in appealing to the possibility of illegal opposition, if only rhetorically, since terrorists, as we know, don't usually advertise their intentions in the press, Blanchard was running a risk, a risk inherent in all political action. For on what grounds, one might ask, on what grounds is one to differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate violence, between just force and unjust force? The only way to resolve the conundrum, it seems, is to appeal to a notion of justice. And though it may be true that the demands of justice are absolute and that justice cannot be deferred, except at the cost of turning into injustice, what constitutes justice cannot ever be determined wholly in advance. It's what's known, as some of you will know, as the discretion of judges or PhD examiners or political strategists, which explains why even in 1984, Blanchard was of a mind that I quote, political thought perhaps still remains to be discovered. Even if politics is everything, then it is therefore still not all. Yeah. But in January 1937, so the following year, Blanchard was next found writing a regular political and literary column for L'Insurgé, and that's the paper which you can see on your screen. This is, um, this is one of the early, I think this is actually the first um, of the, um, this is a paper which was a weekly, which lasted for about 11 months, and that's its first issue. And you will see at the top, l'abjection française, French abjection. This was an attack by Blanchot and his friends on the current state of the French government. The French, um... Now, in, in L'Insurgie, much more than in Comba, there is prolific recourse to anti-Semitic phraseology. And I quote a lot of it in, in the book, in particular, where Prime Minister Leon Blum was concerned. It was, however, hardly systematic, but it was widespread and flagrant. And the instances which are not numerous, where Blanchot's own writings do um, give in, seemingly, to this um, anti-Semitic rhetoric, I think can be explained in the same way as the one in Kumba I was mentioning a moment ago. And the, the other disagreements between Blanchot and his fellow contributors that you found in Kumba soon asserted themselves in La Sciorge. For the majority of them who represented the national syndicalist, monarchist right, France's biggest enemy by far was the Soviet Union. 
For Blotter, however, it was plain the greatest threat to France and to peace was that posed by Hitler. Now, Blanchot's critics have tended to ignore the disagreements at the centre of Lanciorgi to concentrate, as I said, on those relatively limited instances where articles signed with Blanchot's name seem to make use of anti-Semitic phraseology. Though I can't, don't have time to go into details, I think, as in the case of Combo, it is extremely unlikely that Blanchot himself authored those passages. But even so, a further set of questions arise. Why, one has to ask, I think, why did Blanchot continue writing for a paper, which he did for 11 months, in which anti-Semitic language was far from infrequent, even if in the end, as he told his friend Roger Laporte in 1984, he did everything necessary to pull the plug on the paper, precisely because of its execrable anti-Semitism. Before then, had Blanchot remained blind to anti-Semitism? Or conversely, was he trying to wean his readers off their anti-Semitism on the grounds that the real questions lay elsewhere, as they indeed did? Blanchard's account begs many questions, but it explains, however, why at the end of 1937, at a time when anti-Semitism in France, on the right and at times on the left, was ever more prevalent, he scuppered L'Insurgé, wrote his last articles for Kumba, and till the very end of his life, which of course was in 2003, would never again sign with his name a political article in the press. Wow. But before signing off, finally in November, December 1937, Blanchard left his fellow journalists and readers with some enigmatic and seemingly paradoxical parting words under the title, Dissidents Wanted, on demand des dissidents. What does this mean? The true form of dissidence, he explained, and I'm quoting again, the true form of dissidence is that which abandons one position without ceasing to observe the same hostility towards the opposite position, or rather which abandons it in order to accentuate this hostility. A true communist dissident is one who leaves communism not in order to move closer to capitalist beliefs, but to define the true conditions of struggle against capitalism. In the same way, the true nationalist dissident is one who neglects the traditional formulas of nationalism, not in order to move closer to internationalism, but to combat international. In embracing in this way an elusive third term beyond communism and capitalism, nationalism and internationalism, Blanchard was not of course endorsing fascism, as some, as some have claimed, but invoking a probably unfindable position outside the binary paradigm of conventional politics in order to pose afresh the very question of the possibility of a politics, which was also to say, as Blanchard would quickly realize, that any politics worthy of the name could not be other than a contestation of all politics. Now, contrary to what is sometimes suggested, Blanchard didn't abandon politics in 1937, though he ceased signing articles in the press, but he continued writing for the Journal des Débats and contributing alongside Paul Lévy to Ose Écoute. Now, this is Ose Écoute, and I'll come to this in just a moment. This is another weekly satirical magazine. This is the front cover with a um, cartoon you will all rapidly understand. Um, Blanchot in 1938 had good reason to carry on writing his political journalism. For that year, 1938 brought several further political emergencies, notably in March, the annex Hitler's annexation of Austria, the Anschluss, and most fateful of all, at the end of September, and this is what this um, cartoon relates to in one of the front page of Uzi Kut, at the end of September, in a dismal repetition of March 1936, the Munich Accords signed between the British and French governments, Mussolini and Hitler, by which it was agreed to hand over to Nazi Germany the predominantly German-speaking territories of Western Czechoslovakia. Peace in our time. It was trumpeted, you all know the slogan. Many on the left, 
not without serious misgivings, however, again breathed a sigh of relief. While the nationalist right, though France had a treaty of mutual assistance with Czechoslovakia, congratulated the government in failing to go to war for a far off country of which it knew little and cared even less. And in Ozi Kut, Levy, Levy, Paul Levy and Blanchot, as one might expect, took a robustly different view, arguing that to make concessions to Hitler was not to prevent war, but as events proved, to make it ever more likely. And this, of course, is what this um, cartoon says. Is that the true peace? The Hitler pretending with his um, olive branch, um, but really, in reality, marching with his jack boots, followed by the um, Wehrmacht. This is what Munich actually meant. So far from being a diplomatic victory, then Munich, in Paul Levy's words, was France's most overwhelming defeat since the Battle of Sedan in September 1870, which had marked at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, Germany's comprehensive victory over France. This was, of course, was what they thought Munich would bring. Despite the unpopularity continued a campaign against the Nazi threat, with Uzi Kud publishing first-hand testimony from Germany on Nazi concentration camps, in particular Buchenwald, and other repressive measures directed at Jews, left-wing political activists, and others reporting in detail and at length on the events surrounding Kristallnacht in November 1938. Now, it's sometimes argued that Blanchot, though he may not have been an anti though he may have not been an anti-Semite, said very little about the fate of the Jews um, in Hitler's Germany at the end of the, during the 1930s. Um, this is simply untrue. The, what you see there, La Razzia, is, though it's not signed by Blanchot, appeared in Uzi Kut, which was run by Paul Levy, the um, edit, general editor was none other than Blanchot, and it reports in quite detail the events surrounding Kristallnacht. Um, in November 1938. Um, nevertheless, you know what happened next. As Blanchot and Levy had feared, Hitler next invaded Poland. War was declared by France and Britain in September 1939, and the following spring, Nazi Germany invaded France, defeated its poorly prepared army, which resulted in June in the controversial signature of the armistice between Hitler and Pétain, the partition of France, and in July, the establishment of a puppet government in Vichy. Now, I don't know how well you've been following the debates surrounding Blanchot's politics in the 30s, but it has recently been suggested that in those early months of the occupation, on the basis of three issues of Uzi Kut, this um, Paul Levy's journal, which carried on through July uh, and August, on the basis of three issues of Uzi Kut, um, that appeared under Vichy censorship, that Blanchot, as has been claimed, was a keen advocate of the Vichy regime under Pétain. But I think anyone who is familiar with the um, past history of both uh, Blanchot and Lévy um, know this to be um, a anything but the case. Anyone familiar with those positions adopted repeatedly by Levy and Blanchot throughout the decade, know any such claims to be absurd and based, in fact, on a mischievous and myopic reading of the facts. But once France was overwhelmed, as it was by the German army, the question remained how to resist the occupation, how to resist Vichy. It was impossible to wait, though, of course, it wouldn't be till 1943, so a good three years further on, that an effective resistance movement could be organized. Among various political initiatives that Blanchot launched in this, from the summer of um, 1940, there is one for which he became subsequently well known, but for which once again, more recently, he has been fiercely criticized. In April, 1941, he began writing again for the Journal des Débats, which had by now rallied to the Vichy cause. 
not in order to publish political articles as in the past, but literary criticism. These are the texts which led to the first volume of criticism by Blanchot for Par. Um, but critics have charged, was this not to give implicit approval to the Vichy regime? Would it have been better to say nothing and refuse to publish anything under Vichy censorship laws? To do so, however, would have meant conceding victory to the very people it was proposed one should resist by remaining silent. So if writing about literature under Vichy was inevitably political, then the only possible course of action was to harness literature to the cause of the political, but not in any customary manner. Now, it is, at issue here is the absorbing and difficult and complicated question of the relationship in Blanchard's own thinking between politics or the political and literature, that of others and his own. For as he embarked on this three and a half year stint as a literary critic with the Journal des Débats, it shouldn't be forgotten that Blanchard throughout the 1930s had been hard at work, among others, on the novel Thomas the Obscure, Thomas the Obscure which having by then gone through several different versions, would finally appear in print in 1941. Now, Tomal Obscure, as all its readers know, is a text impossible to summarise in a few short words, or even to summarise at all. The question it asks is, however, closely linked to the questions Blanchot, as political commentator, never ceased asking. That question is a founding question, and it is the question of foundation itself, or rather of the founding impossibility of that ontological foundation, which Heidegger professed to find in the poetry of Hölderlin, but which for Blanchot, an otherwise more astute reader of the poet, was nothing other than impossibility itself. And not for nothing in this regard is the protagonist in Blanchot's first novel named Thomas, since Thomas, Doma, is a name as in Aramaic, but more importantly still, a name that signifies the abyss. Tomal Obscure, in other words, imagines or dramatizes what appears or doesn't appear when the world is set aside to be examined from the perspective of its possible foundation, or more precisely, of its plummeting abyssal non-foundation. As, as in the case of, po of politics for Blanchot, there is in the case of literature, an unthematizable excess that precedes all constitution, which it enables and disables, authorizes and outstrips. There is, in other words, something deeply political about any artwork, not because it embodies worldly familiarity, not because it presents what is true or untrue, not because it imitates the real world, not because it provides its readers with moral instruction, but because it does none of those things, or rather only does them insofar as it suspends them, splits them apart, sets them aside from themselves in order to address an otherness that, as Blanchard once wrote apropos of Kafka, is other than all world. Now, Blanchot in later years, some of you will know this, instead of providing his publisher with an author's biography, had his books inscribed with the following words, I quote, his life is entirely devoted to literature and to the silence proper to it. And of course, Blanchot has been much criticized for this silence. But silence in Blanchot's writing is nothing evasive. It is very different, I think, in that regard to what has been what has come to be known as Heidegger's silence. And yet it's sometimes argued if one accepts Blanchot's own strictures in criticizing Heidegger for failing to address the fate of the Jews under the Nazi regime he supported philosophically, should one not condemn Blanchot for failing to confess in public to his own pre-war political acts? The question is of course a loaded one. It assumes Blanchot has something to confess which, as I've tried to show, is far from self-evident, and it sets at naught everything Blanchot did write, among other things, on Judaism, the Shoah, and the responsibility shared by all for the atrocities of history. And let us be clear, it was not Blanchot who gave support to a criminal regime, instrumentalized poetry in its cause, and omitted to remember the deaths of so many.
Blanchot's silence is quite other. It is, one might say, the silence of that which is as yet unspoken, which comes from the future, exceeds all boundaries, interrupts all power, questions all meaning, and, well, and without delay demands justice for all forms of life and for a planet in distress. It is a silence that teaches dissent, refusal, resistance. <laughs>